Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Technical Glass lecture. I take the opportunity to thank our sponsor, Technoglass. They've been supporting us for uh, eight years now and very generously allowing us to bring you the best. So we have with us tonight uh, Sandra Barclay and Jean-Pierre Cruz who founded their practice in 1994 in Paris. In 2006, they moved to their base to Lima, Peru, while continuing to pursue some activity in France through the Parisian studio Atelier Nord Sud. They frame their practice as a design laboratory that explores the bonds between uh, landscape, climate, and architecture, addressing specific local conditions in developing countries while also aiming for universal resonance on a global stage. Their work has been recognized by the 2018 Mies Crown Hall America's Prize and the first Oscar Niemeyer Prize, among other international awards, including the 2013 Latin American Prize and the Peruvian Architecture National Prize in 2014 and 2018. Barclay and Cross have been exhibited and published worldwide in leading venues. Their publications include three monographs and they generously shared uh, one of them with me tonight. They curated, uh, oh, so they, they are regular participants in the Venice Biennial as you know, one of the most prestigious uh, arenas. By the way, I take the opportunity to thank our colleague, Jermaine Barnes, who has officially been announced as one of the participants uh, in the biennial this summer. So very regular, they are regular participants in the biennial. They uh, curated the Peruvian pavilion in the 15th edition. That's uh, in 2016. They were featured in the main exhibition in the 16th biennial. That was in uh, 2018. And Sandra was a member of the 17th biennial's jury in 2001, uh, 21. Sandra and Jean-Pierre were both born in Peru, where they received their education in architecture. They both both earned additional degrees in Europe, France for uh, Sandra in Ecole d'Architecture de Paris Belleville, and Italy for Jean Pierre for in the Politecnico di Milano. They currently have academic appointments at the Pontifica Università Cattolica del Peru and have had visiting positions at Harvard, Yale, and UVA. Please join me in welcoming our guest tonight. Sandra Barclay and Jean-Pierre Cruz. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're going to share. No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so first, uh, we want to thank uh, Dean El Khoury for the invitation. We are really pleased to share with you our lecture that we um, named Constructing Meaning. I think this, this is something we research in each uh, project. And we have to, to share, no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, as Rudy was saying, and we were um, talking about it, we started uh, our practice in, in Paris, in fact, and um, we moved to Lima 16 years later, and it's already 16 years that we've been practicing in, in Peru. So this is the year where we have the same time practicing in, in, uh, in France and in Peru. And, um, and what is interesting for us is that this, uh, we, we've been, practicing in both uh, contexts as locals, not, not exporting architecture, but working uh, uh, 
as, as uh, locals. So um, that has questioned us uh, about the, the nature of uh, practice of architecture and push us to find the, the, the meaning of what we do. Um, so when we went back to Peru, we were forced to um, rethink the conditions and processes from the specificities of the global South, uh, South America, Peru, so uh, an, an industrialized country. Uh, and soon we realized that if we wanted to root our practice in, in this new reality, the opportunities were to be found in, in the problems that we had. Searching for openings offered by, by the fragility of commissions, the discontinuity of processes, and the scarcity of technical and economical uh, resources. Um, when we arrived uh, in Europe, we started by unlearning what we were told during our training as architects in Peru. Give away certitudes and start a long fieldwork research, constructing our own architectural culture through observation. Learning by doing has been key to our practice. In each project, we go from a sketch to the model, then to the technical drawing and into reality and then back to the model, the sketch, the drawing in a circular dynamic between the mind, the hand, and the matter. And our built projects uh, shown here at the same scale, uh, on the upper left are the first ones, uh, down to the right, the last ones, and they cover this large span of, of uh, in time, in, in programs, dimensions, locations, and they are all related uh, by the aim to root architecture to its place, but still have the power to inform and be pertinent in a broader context. They respond to some recurrent research subjects uh, that relate them all. So uh, tonight we, we will present some of them uh, through five of these subjects. The first one is about topography and pre-existences. My first professional experience in France was working for Alvaro Sisa's team in the urban proposal for Montreuil on the outskirts of Paris. Sisa's approach opened our eyes to a field of action. Meaning is conveyed by rooting buildings in their pre-existences historical and recent, physical and cultural. In Montreuil, he was attentive to reveal a particular topography that defined the reasons why the town settled there. By doing this, he defined the form and orientation of the new structures to be built. Montreuil was known by its pitch production, thanks to a system of walls built to create thermal inertia and ensure pitch production in the cold season. Even if these walls are nowadays nearly gone, the urban project considered new buildings should be installed perpendicular to the level curves to reveal the natural slope that gave sense to build that landscape. And by following the same topographic, topographical logic as the pitch walls, preserve the existing remnants. And some years uh, later, we developed uh, a sector of CISA's uh, plan with our partners, Laurent uh, Emmanuel Baudouin from Nancy, uh, designing the social housing projects. Uh, the buildings were carefully inserted in vacant places at the edge and in the middle of a big urban block where massive housing developments of, of the 1970s were um, built and encroached on historical buildings. Uh, the buildings, follow the slope to reveal both the topography of the town and the inner gardens of the urban block. Uh, doing this, we could uh, integrate the remaining pitch walls that we see here in, in brown um, in the plan um, into the newly created public gardens and into the city. 
And these are images uh, uh, today, uh, last year, 20 years later, uh, where we can see these gardens and, the, and the, some of the pitch walls. After finishing the project in Montreuil, we won a competition for a bigger housing project in Nantes on French Atlantic coast, where preexistences and topography were again fundamental in our approach. The 170 unit mixed typology housing project gathered together collective housing with individual houses in which 30% of them should be subsidized social dwellings. The project had to be built in a vacant place where an old farm stood surrounded by suburban tissue of the growing city that we see in the images at left on the top right. At left and on top right. We decided to keep the old farm's enclosure, the water tower, and the abandoned farmhouse as a way to acknowledge the site's memory. Even if it was a considerably dense intervention on the site, we wanted the project to preserve the urban presence of the old fabric, as we see in the bottom image. Following a topographical logic, the parking is conceived as a plinth placed under the collective housing, while the individual houses are located on the core of the site. The fact of not bringing the car to each house allowed, allowed us substantial economies. So we were able to provide social housing with the same typology than the free market houses. We could reduce the access roads to narrow pedestrian passages take rainwater drainage to the surface and make it follow the natural slope, leading to a shared public garden equipped by a retention pond. Creating narrow pedestrian passages to access the houses allowed us also to relate the new urban space to non-traditional urban typologies. Keeping the enclosure allowed us also to relate both to the memory of the farm and the memory of the city. As we change the focus of our practice to Peru, fundamental approaches to design were similar, but the strategies related to the mode of production of architecture changed radically. Connecting with preexistences as a way to root architecture to its local condition and acknowledging memory as a design tool were the continuities. And Paying attention to topography, however, operated a change, uh, a big change of, of scale. And what in Europe was an issue of topography, in Peru it turned into a geographical uh, one. Um, when confronted with the Andes Mountains, Alexander von Humboldt that drew this, this uh, section, um, acknowledges uh, acknowledge the differences uh, with Europe. Uh, he said, and I quote, in the old world, the nuances and differences form the main focus of, of the picture. In the new world, man and his productions disappear, so to speak, in the midst of a wild and outside uh, nature, end of quote. So Humboldt arrived uh, in Lima in 1803 and went north to what is today Ecuador, where he synthesized this, this section. Um, and he realized that, that biodiversity was here directly related to altitude. And he found a local culture that was intimately tied to, to the land. Most important for us architect, he realized that the section and not the plan is the only way to understand this region. And this um, section is so precise that we can locate our Peruvian projects in it. Due to the tropical setting, the fact that these projects are like uh, 2000 miles away from each other, uh, some of them at least, is uh, totally relevant. It is altitude that defines the climatic and topographical conditions relevant to architecture. Working along with the section, 
from the barren landscapes of, of the uh, desert coast through the steep mountain range into the Amazon jungle helped us rethink the geographical challenges we had from a design point of view. So understanding the section is critical to, to link the territorial and the architectural scale. So we will try to explain the, our, these projects by showing mainly their sections. So in Peru, land and platforms, the, the second subject, uh, became main issues. Introducing uh, the way we were going to, to address our projects. And here, as you can see, um, the site never ends in the property boundaries. Um, even if these are ancient sites, in the modern sites, it's the same. And we as architects are constantly blurring the artificial boundaries between architecture, urban design, and landscape architecture. And trained as uh, Moneo put it, and I quote, to discern those attributes of the site that should be maintained and emphasized, and those that should disappear in the new reality that emerges through the construction progress. So, even in the, in the case of project in the barren desert, we had a lot of pre-existences to give up the keys to intervene. We designed our first Peruvian projects in this cove. Being built in a span of 10, 12 years, these houses are located between the ocean and the Andes, where a great, and where a great design laboratory in which we learn how to relate to this landscape from one project to another. In this improbable tropical land, characterized by the absence of rains, extreme hot or cold days, and no strong winds, climate gives us a huge opportunity for redefining architecture and its very role of providing shelter. We start by drawing a section First, the slope of the cove, then an emerging platform in order to define a new horizontal ground for life. After that, we define an enclosure that ensures domesticity and intimacy, providing shade to the platform and framing the ocean view. Finally, a pool brings the ocean to the platform and serves as a natural railing. Underneath, we excavate the platform to create the rooms for intimacy the bedrooms protected from the setting sun by the pool. They all follow the same logic, even if each one responds to different needs. Seen from the desert at left, it seems uh, the hole seems as excavated on the sand, while from the beach at right, houses seem to emerge from the cliff. The staircase articulate both levels under the platform glazed windows of the intimate rooms blur the differences between transparency, reflection, and opaqueness. And from the, the Peruvian coast, we uh, go up 3,800 meters over the Pacific Ocean to Moray near the uh, Cusco. And uh, international competition for designing an agricultural research center and, uh, and lodging was launched just before the pandemic. We proposed that research should focus in managing water resources in, in the era of global warming uh, as the critical issue for improving architecture, uh, agriculture, sorry, uh, in the Andes. So that was one of the reasons our scheme was uh, chosen. And in order to make the environment inhabitable, and an altitude of more than uh, 11,000 feet, we followed the strategies the Incas employed in these places. So uh, just taking advantage of the existing topography and orientations to create favorable conditions for life with a minimum effort to achieve these goals. So the, the project was at, at right, at, 
left is 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 Morai, is more or less uh, six hundred meters uh, away, and uh, the proposal was to bring the ancestral infrastructural systems for water uh, retaining as infiltration canals, reservoirs, and terraces uh, to the architectural scale in order to collect water and use it during the dry season. The combination of the different systems would define the intervention on the site. And a careful use of the site's topography combining excavation and infill to avoid earth removal allowed us to bring natural light to all spaces with a minimum impact on, on landscape. The building is conceived as an inhabitable water retaining infrastructure, as most of pre-Columbian intervention that served for both uh, living and domesticating the harsh vertical landscape. In this uh, aerial view looking towards uh, Morai, we can see that the existing ravine um, receives the logistics of the Water Management Research Center. The protected uh, platforms and its garden provide the needed intimacy to the guest rooms and study rooms. And looking from Morai to the other side, uh, the subtle earth movement is almost invisible, oh, sorry, uh, invisible from the archeological site. So all the living spaces turn around the main water reservoir, which is nourished by infiltration canals and landscape around is a non-landscape, is, is, is natural uh, vegetation that change with the seasons, the reservoirs being depleted during the dry season. And these living spaces are protected from the chilly wind by a sunken garden, creating a microclimate where highland vegetation can, can grow. And some years before the Morai project, and at a less extreme altitude, only 2,800 meters, we were called to do a master subdivision plan, taking advantage of the craftsmanship that still exists to build these infrastructures. We transformed the slope with traditional terraces, which would also materialize the required allotment. The site then resonates with a landscape that humans have transformed for centuries, dividing the plots by terraces instead of the walls that were required in the, in the brief. And some few years later, we built this house there. Mountains are so powerful that we felt it could not, that the project could not refer to local architecture, but to geography. The challenge was to converge the vastness of the territory with the intimacy of living spaces. Inca's sacred rocks helped downscaling the immeasurable to domesticate mountains. In the same way, the shape of the house resonates with the surrounding mountains. We draw again a section as a way to understand the project. We start drawing the sacred mountains of Pitucirai down in the valley. The natural slope is modified in platform terraces to create space for living. A pitch roof and a gutter frame the mountain and create the place of intimacy by defining a courtyard. Sun from the east warms the house in the morning while setting sun hits the stone cladding of the roof and diffuses heat at nighttime. The house was built with the available technology and craftsmanship as we did previously with the allotment terraces. The entry porch frames the sacred mountains. It marks the threshold between the open space of the valley and the domestic courtyard. Climbing up to the second floor, we arrive to an elevated terrace overseeing the valley. So traces and memory and are intimately intertwined. Richard Long uh, walked a line in the Peruvian desert, as you see in the, at the, in the left image, and described this uh, as, and I quote, a mark a layer built upon thousands of other geographic and cultural layers. In fact, humans 
did that for centuries in, in this place. Not far from Long's uh, land art piece, Paracas people and their successors, the Nazca, made the famous lines 2,000 years ago to ask deities for water when this land was drying up. Their traces still mark the presence of their absence. The Paracas Archaeological Site Museum was destroyed by a strong earthquake in 2007, and the European Union financed its reconstruction and launched an architectural competition the following year. We had a quite short budget and a sublime landscape as main ingredients for the project. We decided to keep the memory of the previous museum by building in the exact same location, respecting the overall volume and geometry, and in addition, avoid archeological surveys that were mandatory if we build Ellsworth in that site. We wanted to introduce landscape logics into architecture, bringing again the immeasurable to the human scale. Seen from the archeological burial site, the museum modifies landscape and at the same time depends on it, as would a rock or a trace in the desert. Another layer, as Richard Long would say. A porch announces the entrance to the enclosure, acting as a threshold between the vastness of the desert and the open air inner circulation. In a climate where rain is inexistent, the different programs can be related among them by this contained exterior space. The single story building has a technical level on top of it to receive future museographic equipment we couldn't afford. In section, the first element we defined over the undulating sandy ground was an enclosure. And seen from the burial site, the fifth facade or the folding roof is conceived as a protection from the sun and the strong winds of this region. Finally, the low tech environmental devices of the technical level find their place beneath the roof and help defining the exhibition spaces. These devices help us control natural light and ventilation. Actually, the museum works without artificial light. In the future, more technological equipment will be possible to install in these technical spaces. They also help define the exhibition spaces and organize the museographical sequence in a continuous and fluid space. And they are also structural elements. When reaching the southern facade, they become windows framing the burial hills. And uh, 13 years ago, this is Lima, a national competition was launched to build the place of remembrance on the edge of uh, its bay. A presidential commission led by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, which is our Nobel Prize uh, writer, planned to build a cultural center that would articulate the efforts of an entire generation to convey to the future ones the memory of 20 years of extreme violence and intolerance that devastated our country and left more than 70,000 dead. So we believed the building uh, couldn't directly relate with the memory of violence as architecture is meant to dignify people. So we started to relate uh, to the site's own memory as a way to approach uh, the project. It was a residual area uh, left by the destruction of one of these successions of cliffs and ravines that characterized the Bay of Lima when a roadway to the beaches wa was uh, created. So our intervention would reveal layers of memory and significance, like if it was an addition on this pre-existence. Following the topographical logic, the building merges with the site as an artificial cliff. And by doing that, uh, 
this addition would be related to the memory, not only by its programmatic content, but the mem memory of Lima's uh, landscape in a territorial scale. So the building closes a sequence of cliffs and ravines uh, that is long more than 10 kilometers uh, because to the left uh, or to the north, it's, it's, uh, these cliffs have been cut. So this is the last um, cliff on, the, on Limas Bay. And if we draw a cutoff longitudinal section of the cliffs, we can visualize that the infill made to create the descent to the beach um, was a, a problem. Uh, so a compact building uh, near the natural cliff allowed us to economize both in the number of foundation piles and in their depth. In this way, the territorial logic was meeting also the economical logic. And the site had still a strong handicap. There was almost no connection to the city. So we decided to transform this major problem for this kind of uh, building into a design opportunity uh, by creating a narrow uh, passage connecting the city to the site. And by doing that, what we introduced was time in the way we approached the building. So the visitor leaves the city behind and gets into a gap created between the cliff and the building. And at the bottom of this newly created ravine, there is a marked physical consciousness, uh, a kind of in intensified presence because we are not, not anymore in an urban setting and we are not uh, on, in the ocean side landscape. And we can get ready to see an exhibit which is not easy to, to, to see at least for Peruvians. And on the other side of the, of the artificial cliff, uh, we have this platform that looks over the sea conceived as a public space for uh, reconciliation. The experience of space through time is essential as we walk through the building also. The different exhibition spaces are accessible through a series of ramps and they help to slow down time, which was our, our, our will, and be able to separate the path of the eyes from the path of, of the feet. And here space is uh, made only by the building structure. Exhibition is shown on pieces of furniture and, and nothing more. And we arrive to the rooftop in this sequence of ramps. Uh, and, and this rooftop is conceived as a new ground where we discover the horizon, the horizon, and, and, um, and we have for the first time an outstanding view over Lima's Bay. And from there, we can uh, go back to the city. So we never meet in this, in this kind of museum, we, we don't meet or people getting in don't meet with the people getting out in the, in the, in the shop, no? in the souvenir shop, but in the city itself. Uh, and we can, we have a little uh, video where we can see how it lives. Uh,
until now this place is threatened by politicians who try uh, to close it, to close this institution because it talks about corruption in the government also. So we go to our fourth subject. And we, we like to say that we, in Peru, we shift from uh, drawing plans as a main issue for, uh, main goal of our practice to building uh, maps. Um, the most striking differences between working in a developer, uh, developed country uh, as France and a developing one as Peru are the ways of making architecture. In places where craftsmanship is still naturally committed to quality through care and pride, and not a specialized one, but the, the, the people that make any building, um, the inherent imperfections that come with man-made processes leave marks on buildings. On the other hand, working in this context, in the Peruvian con context, offers invaluable advantage, at least for us. Uh, first of all, possibility of hybridization between the artisanal, mostly local, and the industrialized, uh, mostly foreign technologies, and the extension of the creative process uh, through the construction stage. Uh, while building the illusion of control that we architects are trained to, to, to have uh, is replaced by a constant dialogue with the craftsmen and the builders, which introduces them as visible actors in the actual building outcome. With our first houses in Peru built while we were still practicing in France, came some essential questions. So how can scarcity of resources be treated as an opportunity? Can construction processes ascribe meaning to the building itself? How do buildings age here, etc.? Traditional architecture, when local craftsmanship is still alive, can give us clues about how to recover forgotten or undervalued materials and use them in a contemporary way. In the place of remembrance, uh, craftsmanship and limited resources was what we had at our disposal. So it made sense to combine them, making the handmade imperfection our ally. We didn't use a crane and employ more labor, which in our country is still an available asset. Man-made traces are no longer an inevitable defect and become uh, an open possibility of generating meaning in our way of relating to the construction. So the construction marks are here related to the very memory of the uh, act of building. In this, uh, in these buildings, uh, the plans, which uh, are documents that anticipate a future action, uh, lose their primacy and the building itself becomes a map. That means the record of an action that took place in the past. You know? uh, so the map is related to the act of constructing. 
It becomes a record of human intervention and the traces of which are visible in the building itself. So uh, it made a lot of sense in the uh, place of remembrance because it was dealing with the memory and by uh, acting like this, we, for in, 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 in on one side, um, we recognize the the the, um, the work of of people in this in this building, um, and uh, this was the evidence of human labor, and become became the the visible memory of human intervention. Uh, so we can see uh, here each worker lived his trace with his uh, which is recognizable in the whole and we decided to uh, keep all the traces of the construction even if it was were errors or or whatever uh, including for instance at, at left the the traces of of the watchdog that you see in the in the previous slide uh, in the first uh, cement no and um, on the right we decided uh, to to stamp the the hands of the workers uh, in the entrance uh, we we of course didn't um uh invented this this was uh from le corbusier to to uh, widobro etc uh, we we try to make sense of these things in in this in this building and it it not only it was not only particular to this building but but other buildings as the paracas museum where you can see the the um uh, scarcity of resources, no, um, and the, um, we could only afford uh, for the construction uh, a plastered cement over a traditional masonry. So we used a naturally reddish zolanic cement that is is uh, has ferrite, ferrite, uh, uh, and and it becomes with the sun it becomes reddish. Uh, that is also uh, a cement that is uh, resistant to saline soil. And by doing that, we, we ask uh, workers to polish it in a, with a similar technique used for polishing the pre-Columbian vases. And this time, of course, we scale to the size of the building as if it was a huge ancient vase. So the cheapest way to finish the building and uh, stay within the budget was also a way to transform the museum in a map of human intervention. Uh, and we were talking about uh, layers. The, this is another cultural layer in the desert uh, relating to the memory of the place. Um, when building the, the Wayokari house the, in the Andes, instead of imposing uh, a stone layout, we let workers to express their understanding on how this local and this stone should be put together. And, and then um, we asked uh, uh, people uh, to put the leftovers of the wellstone work to the, do the courtyard uh, paving. And we can see the, the, um, the care with which they, they are putting them. But even in projects that we use prefab uh, panels or, or uh, like, like this uh, concrete bris uh, for the acad academic compound in, in the north of Peru, um, even there, there we should um, accommodate a, a, a bigger tolerance uh, because uh, here is not uh, prefab panels are not in the in the tolerance of the millimeter, but in the tolerance of centimeters. Uh, even if they they were uh, kind of industrialized, 
Um, so having a long facade and a, uh, this tolerance of centimeters, we decided not, not to put the last panels because they, won't, they wouldn't fit and, and use them instead in, uh, to mark the bike parking uh, at one of the access. So all those decisions were, of course, uh, made during the, the, um, the construction process. And um, an imperfection can be very helpful also. In the Mokewa region headquarters, uh, we planned to have prefab plan, uh, panels of uh, two color tones. Um, so when the concrete manufacturer wasn't able to produce a constant color for the panels, um, we didn't say anything. So we ended with dozens of nuances as well as a stone cladding that, uh, that we couldn't afford it. We were, uh, if we asked to, to the, the, the manufacturer to do that. And this is uh, our fifth uh, subject, microcosm and the indoor exterior. The representation of uh, Eden by Kircher at left shows a friendly space secluded from an inhospitable outside. So what's inside constitutes a world in itself, or at least an image of it, recreating an intelligible, understandable microcosm. This approach to make the immeasurable inhabitable is transversal to all cultures. The Eden is a microcosm, is not about an orderly nature. It's a cultural and topological act. It's a garden and a house simultaneously. Experiencing the outdoors as an interior has always attracted us. And working in Peru with its particular mild climate and absence of rains has allowed us to create indoor exteriors, bringing together intimacy and vastness. And when asked to design a restaurant that could represent Lima's uniqueness in a low rise, but quite packed neighborhood, the decision to create an indoor exterior landscape in the confined space of the plot appeared as the most appropriate. The typical introspection of colonial and pre-Hispanic residences and their lighting and ventilation devices were very useful for this project. The enclosure helps to create here a quiet place. Five modular volumes are supported by the enclosure, organizing a series of in-between indoor exterior spaces. From the street, the building appears as quite opaque and introverted. Only the skylights give us a hint of what will be discovered inside. The in-between spaces are alternately compressed and expanded by the asymmetric arrangement of the five modules, producing the quality of an intimate urban space where Slima's white, white sky becomes the ceiling. Once inside, each module defines a precise space with a precise function, but at the same time opens up and merges with a continuous open exterior space. And the discrete volume typology responded to the mild climate and helped uh, create a microcosmos in a reduced space. And we could apply these strategies in building of a very different scale as the uh, Mokewa Regional Government Headquarters. Um, it is located uh, 1,200 kilometers south from Lima, uh, near the Chilean border, but in the same place in Humboldt section, in the desert strip at the foothills of the Andes. An architectural competition was launched to build the region headquarters uh, in a new cultural and commercial neighborhood between the city and, and the mountains. Um, the understanding of top topography led us to create a public square as a new center for the city. And it wasn't uh, asked in, in the brief. In order to mark a, a threshold to the open landscape, the ground unfolds into a new high ground or plinth that contains services and archives. And the office program finds its place in a compact structure above the plinth. 
defining an entrance atrium where the views of the city and the mountains are framed. The narrow courtyards between the offices control the direct sunlight and favors uh, cross ventilation. We can see in the plan a little bit how it works. Um, a circular blind perimeter prevents the rising and setting sun to get inside. And both uh, the buildings and the courtyards are connected by a big central outdoor covered atrium. The atrium marks the entrance to the complex and is open for citizens uh, to enjoy shade and, and freshness. Once inside, we're still in an open outdoor space covered by a metallic structure that allows warm air to get out and ensure a natural ventilation to all spaces. The lateral courtyards are directly linked to this central space. And all the offices are light uh, from, from these narrow courtyards. In the city of Piura, only four degrees south from the equator, the local university needed more space for welcoming a new student population from low income rural backgrounds, being able to pursue their education thanks to a government scholarship. New facilities of generic classrooms and faculty offices were needed. Their aspiration was to take this opportunity to improve teaching infrastructure and gave us the opportunity to go beyond a standard response to this need. When the university was founded 50 years ago, it looked like the top image. The 1983 Nino phenomenon brought heavy rains to the desert, and the authorities grasped this as an opportunity to plant carob trees. So the campus construction would continue by planting trees instead of buildings. This vision made a campus like this today. The decision of developing a campus by creating shade in the harshness of the sun and extreme dry heat of the savanna landscape of the Northern Peru was of course a big inspiration for us. Again, uh, the section can help us understand the projects. We start drawing the soft hills of the tropical dry forest, then uh, the planted carob trees and the clearing that was left for future buildings, as you can see uh, in the image. Uh, and then we uh, extend the shade of the forest at the place of the building by a single horizontal line capable of creating good conditions for learning. Then the program grows from the rooftop down to the ground as in, in La Tourette. Uh, and the result is um, a series of, of buildings uh, which are less important than the spaces left uh, in between them where informal learning uh, and gathering spaces find their place. For us was this um, in between spaces were uh, essential in order that the people from these two different backgrounds could, could meet uh, outside classes. As in the dry forest where you know, the, the, the tree is not more important than the whole, six different types form uh, 11 uh, different buildings disposed in a regular volume of 70 by 70 meters and nine meters uh, height. This uh, apparently a compact scheme shelters a permeable shaded space. Each single building responds in shape and form to its use uh, as an amphitheater, a workshop or a faculty office. It allows to comply with the regulation of, of uh, seismic, um, uh, anti-seismic structures. The periphery is perfectly orientated to the cardinal points. Uh, so uh, that could uh, help respond to the passive environmental strategies as allowing, for instance, natural cross ventilation from the southern winds 
and make air conditioning uh, unnecessary, and therefore reducing the energy consumption. The complex is also um, permeable in its access from three sides so that it becomes a shaded crossroad in, in the campus. Following the logics of an oriented building, the south and north sides are protected by vertical louvers, which are very efficient to protect both facades in the equatorial latitude. In the west facade, a system of prefab concrete panels protect the faculty offices from the setting sun. The east side building faces the access from the campus pedestrian pathways and hosts the ramps that connects both levels. The entrance building is in fact a threshold where we pass from the strong glare of the equator to the shaded exterior space of the learning landscape. The lattice shattering serves as a light modulator in order to accommodate our eyes to the shaded half-light spaces while we go up through the ramps or just entering the building. And the narrow gaps that single buildings leave uh, between them help the light come in and help natural ventilation to pass through. Because the building is oriented, the gaps uh, that are oriented east-west are in fact a, a calendar that registers the sun inclination over the year, while the ones oriented north-south are sun clocks that register the daily movement of, of the sun. And there are places where both uh, meet. Yeah, there are all through the buildings, different spaces where people can gather, rest or chat. Spaces are modulated to favor different kinds of gathering, uh, even in formal classes. And as we get into the complex, these spaces become more important until we arrive to its core. Today, at a given time, Almost 40% of the people in the complex don't have classes in it. It has become a place to stay, meet other people, and have informal conversations. Inspired by the forest, it has become a busy urban space in the campus. The main gathering space is crossed by a stretch of the tropical dry forest. And let's see now how a normal day go by in this building. It was really late. <laughs> there were two cameras, so it was a night. <laughs> As a conclusion, we um, like to say that as, um, architects need to recontextualize our practice by grounding. And only by identifying the local essentials on which meaning is built, not only physical, but also cultural and social, can we free ourselves from the binary condition uh, that is uh, present today 
everywhere, north, south, rich, poor, technological, artisanal, etc. And start building and recognizing ourselves in diversity. It can help us define a shared ground of practice. Um, and we think that being local does not mean using local materials or reproducing vernacular architecture necessarily. It is mainly paying careful attention to reality. On the other hand, the global condition is not an opposing entity. It can be understood beyond the aggressive homogenization of capitalism as the sum of countless local interventions. It can be considered as a hybridization phenomenon. Thank you so much. Thank you.